Victor Williams, and we're back with another episode of Web API 2 Demos and Best Practices. So here we have a little website that is also available on GitHub. And as a best practice, if you have a site that's only Web API, it's friendly to put an index page, simple index.html, that will tell your users that it's a web API and where to go to get information, in this case, the Swagger page. So we have built out our site and we've enabled Swagger. We've told Swagger to use our XML code comments and we've done some other best practices. So the first is that it's extremely polite to provide a version uh, method on your API. And here I'd like to call out the fact that not only do we provide the version string um, as a string, but we provide the separate pieces and the copyright as well. This allows people who are using your API in an automated way to be able to detect when there's a breaking change. And I strongly advise people to use semantic versioning. In other words, if I change the major number from one to two, it means I've broken something in the API. If I version anything else, it means I've made some sort of minor change. You can see the README MD in the source code for discussion and a link to some guidance on semantic versioning. The other thing that's nice is that for the purposes of the demonstration and it's called out in previous videos, it's good to have global error handling. So we'll show you what that looks like. Here's a, a little simulator that actually throws a 400 using our validation exception class. And again, you can take a look at the class in the source code. And what it does is it generates validation errors and returns a 400. And in the message body, it actually enumerates what the various validation errors are. And this is useful for clients such as Angular that might need to consume this 400 error and display something friendly to the user. So generally, when you throw a validation error, the validation errors you include should be written with an eye towards being useful for end users. Also, we can handle 500 errors gracefully. In this case, I'm in debugging mode. And so when I throw a 500 error, I actually get a really nice dump of what happened with all the information. But a simple web configuration change will hide this and just say, and just give back the uh, message that was put into the error. So those are some nice practices. And again, you wouldn't necessarily put these things into production project, but the simulator allows you to play with the sample source code and see how global error handling and tracing is configured in the project. What we're really here to talk about is the the people function and and it's interesting to note that i implemented this using sqlite which is a serverless uh, sql database and you can read about how i did it and look at all the source code up on github but you can do things like you can search for a particular person and here we found edmund smith you can add, update people, get lists of people, delete people, and so on. All the usual CRUD things that you'd expect. Okay, so we've got this great API. And more importantly, what our swashbuckle library has done that we knew get it into our project and configured is that when we look at the raw JSON, that is the actual Swagger file, okay, so here's editor2.swagger.io, and this is the default document that's provided so that you can play with the site. But we're going to go and open and import the URL of our actual Swagger document that matches this, right? The Swagger text from our thing. And we're going to go ahead and say import. And there you can see is our Swagger API. You can even see the little generated helpful page that it made. But that's not what is really, truly useful. What's really, truly useful about this is this, generate client. Wow, look at the number of programming languages and more importantly, the number of variations on things like TypeScript. 
jQuery, Angular, Angular 2, Node, and then Ruby, Scala, Bash, uh, all kinds of great stuff. So let's play with this a little bit as part of this demo. Let's go and generate a client for Bash. So it generated and downloaded a little Bash client. And what do you get? Well, you get a client shell script. So look at this, a little Bash shell script that builds parameters for each of the APIs and then uses curl to call your endpoints and do whatever. So there's base Bash shell that you could take apart and use for your own nefarious purposes. Let's try another one. Generate client. This time, we'll generate one of my favorites, C Sharp. And so here is the C Sharp client. And if we go into the Swagger, not only does it generate a project file with the models, like person and version info, but it also generates all the client uh, responses and it generates all of the API calls, one per uh, controller in our method. So someone could go and generate a client and incorporate this and call your API. And they could use this code generation every time you publish a new API to regenerate the, AP, the API clients. So this is pretty cool. Let's try one more just to show you the power of how clever this is. TypeScript Angular 2 also works with Angular 4, by the way. So here are the APIs. Again, there's an API base class and then one API TypeScript file per controller. And likewise, here are all our models, model base class and then person and version info. And if we look at it, you see that it implements the types that are in our person class. So that is extremely cool and handy. And I strongly advise that you get out of the business of generating by hand web API clients. People can generate clients using Swagger IO's editor tool. And quite frankly, it's fantastic. Stop making your own clients, start using code generation. And if the clients you make aren't any good, that tells you that your API documentation isn't any good either. Good swagger yields good clients. Here's the URL to my GitHub repository where you can download all of this along with a bunch of guidance in the README.